Coming up today on Insurance Hour, we have special guest Catherine Blakespear. We're going to talk about some of her latest bills and how they might affect you going forward. You don't want to miss it. Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. Informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello, and welcome everybody again to Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, here to try and help you with all things insurance, and we have an incredible special guest today. Before I introduce her, I want to remind you that you can reach out anytime if you have any insurance-related questions. Just call 559-656-0317, or you can email questions at insurancehour.com. So without further ado, I want to introduce my special guest that we have, which is Senator Blakespear. Welcome. I, I know that you are uh, extremely busy. You're literally in the car and made time to be able to chat with us. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time by telling everyone how many things you've done, but just to give everyone an idea of just the wide range of things that uh, the senator's worked on. She's worked on everything from gun control laws to home the issue of homelessness to climate change to protecting the environment to improving public transportation. She's already had, I believe it was six or seven bills that have already been authored and signed and are, are already passed the governor. So this is someone that's really getting stuff done. And today, uh, specifically, the reason I wanted to have her here was on some new legislation that is that just hit the, uh, what's the right word? They don't say docket, that's in court. What is it called when you first- It's been introduced, introduced. She has just introduced some new, a new potential bill. And I wanted to talk about that today because it does pertain to insurance. So I thought that would be a perfect, uh, perfect topic for us to talk about. It is AB3067. And rather than me summarizing it, I think I would rather give you the floor to do just that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Carl. I really appreciate being invited to be on your show. Um, it's an honor and a privilege. And so thank you. And to your listeners, thank you for t tuning in today to listen to this. Um, so the bill would require that insurance companies ask people who, if they have a gun in the home and if, and if it is safely stored. Um, and it, it's a little bit more comprehensive than that. So it asks if there's a gun that's stored in a car or in um, any accessory unit on the property and how many uh, firearms there may be and how they are stored, if they're safely stored. Okay, so it's asking, the questions to be asked are, what do you have firearms if it's kept in your home or in your vehicle on the premises? And if it's in a securely locked, uh, locked case by some other statute that already exists defining what a locked case is. Exactly, and th that's the safest way to store firearms is uh, locked so that the person who is supposed to have access to it can, and the person, all the other people, whether there's somebody who breaks into the home or kids in the home or um, somebody feeling suicidal in the home, anything that might be happening that the gun is not uh, readily available. Okay. So that's the safest. The safest way to store a firearm. Correct. And, and in California, you have to actually pass a test in order to purchase a firearm. And that is all over the exam is safe storage of the firearm. And when you purchase a firearm, there's a registry that happens. And then that gun is, is a registered gun in the registry. So I know the, the first question that comes to my mind is since there already is a registry, do we is our are we thinking that people that are purchasing guns other than through a store where they register it will then they'll still tell the insurance carrier when the application comes to them that they have the firearm or what what's our thinking as far as getting the people that aren't already registering it because we have access to that and we're looking to get more people i suppose is the idea right to cast a sort of wider net of knowledge of what's out there well this isn't really a registration bill so you know that that would be a different bill um what, what this bill is doing is it's really trying to get at this issue of safe storage because uh, we know that 75% of guns that are used in school shootings come from the home and de facto that means they're not stored properly because there should never be incidences where children or, or other adult, adults have guns on school campuses. Um, so, so really what we're trying to do is create the data that that then would allow insurance companies to make decisions about that like what 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 exactly let the market forces work so 
if we if we have the data, then we know then we could potentially insurance companies could make decisions about people they might find to be higher risk. And just as an example, insurance companies are already um, behavior is being driven by insurance in, in many contexts. So, like for example, people might decide to put a fence around their pool because their homeowners insurance policy. Um, it would go down. Their homeowners insurance sure, rates go sure. down, or they might just, or they might ha decide not to have a certain breed of dog because there are certain types of those. Are, those are beautiful examples. Dogs. I couldn't have thought of better myself. Yeah. So, so th it's the same idea to to have the data available. Um, and insurance insurance has also really driven safety in automobiles. And what what one of the main things that I'm driven by here is trying to make um, guns having guns be similar to cars. So cars are insured um, and we treat that they are also deadly and we treat them at, we know that they're in wide circulation and we treat them as something that's part of our culture. So I think there are, there are many different uh, viewpoints on firearms, but the reality is there are more of them. There are more firearms than there are people in the country, in this country. By a large margin. And if I remember last I read by a very large margin, exactly. And they are in wide circulation. So how can we make them safer? And I, to me, it's obvious that we ensure everything in this country. We ensure the biggest thing, your life. We ensure the smallest thing, like the thing you send in the mail that might be worth a little bit more to you. You ensure it, or you ensure your trip, or you ensure your pet, or you ensure- I was um, waiting you know, for a pet. I was dying to say, pet, please, okay. <laughs> yes, I mean, health insurance, right? Car insurance, right, right. Home insurance, flood insurance, fire insurance. But guns are the sec are are the biggest killer of youth, and yet they're really not. Ins insurance is not part of our our understanding of the risk of firearms. So, getting at one of the most deadly things, which is guns that are used um, to ki improperly, you know, like things like um, school shootings. Mm -hmm. How is it that? we can make sure that people who own guns are storing them safely. Got it. So as, as a question, so this is, this is great because I read the bill and this flavor, this sort of coloring in the, the sketch is very helpful. So the idea is, because this is one of the big questions, well, we have a gun registry in California, right? So why do we need to ask again? And you're, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying, okay, this isn't a registry. This is to bring awareness to people, number one, so that they're aware for maybe perhaps people that aren't aware of how this needs to be stored. Now, not only will they hear it once they're going to hear it from their insurance brokers and companies as well, because if they don't have it stored properly, they could potentially have a surcharge. They could potentially not be acceptable. There could be all sorts of negative ramifications for them. So you're looking at this as being a a way to try and, like you were saying, change behavior, whether it be fencing the pool, not having certain breeds, putting a new roof on your house that looks like it definitely needs a new roof, things like that that people will do, clearing brush around your house. We do all of these things, you're 100% right, and they're, the only mention of firearms today in California when it comes to property insurance is the fact that in the policy there's a limit on how much they'll pay if you have one stolen. That's it. So I think the idea is the most important thing is everyone needs to understand that this is not about taking guns away. This is not about about removing guns from anywhere. It's about letting the insurance carriers know what type of risk there is or isn't and rewarding people for doing the right thing, which is storing it properly and getting potentially a lower insurance premium for that. And if you're not storing it properly, then you could potentially pay a higher insurance premium or potentially not be able to have a policy with certain insurance companies. And everyone, you know, we, we're, we go with our pocketbooks, right? And uh, if we don't do the right thing because silly us, it's the law and we're supposed to, maybe hopefully we'll at least do it because we can save money by doing the right thing. Right, exactly. Okay, let's take a quick break. The senator has just gotten to her home. We'll switch from car to home, and we'll be right back. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Confidence. 
Hello, hello, and welcome back to Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, and today's special guest, Senator Blakespear. Thank you once again for staying with us, for traveling and, and in your car and making it to your house and still being available to talk. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So before the break, we were talking about the, the main points, what we're trying to accomplish with this bill, which is really awareness and safety. And at the same time, a, a way for consumers to potentially save money on their insurance policies. So I think what is most important in, is people are going to be asking is, well, how is it that the insurance carriers are going to know what I do with my guns, whether I just have it and it sits in the box or whether I have it and I go out shooting on the weekend, how are they going to determine that? Is that something that you're going to be working with the insurance industry to try and become a little more granular with what they're doing, how frequently they use it? Is that something maybe somewhere down the line or is it more of a black and white place at this at this point? Well, you know, we haven't had a lot of feedback yet from the insurance industry, honestly, about this bill. Um, we, we, you know, I had a bill last year which would have required everybody who owns a gun to have an insurance policy and if their gun accidentally killed. Right, the liability someone. policy. I remember that bill. Yeah, their gun, the gun, the, in the same way if your car accidentally kills or injures someone, your car insurance would cover that. Um, and the insurance industry was opposed to that. Um, so I, I, I don't exactly know what um, is going to happen. You know, that bill didn't make it through the insurance committee and didn't make it out, basically out of the state Senate. So I think it, it's a bit maybe premature for a bill that ambitious. Uh, but, you know, focusing on the safe storage aspect of this I, is uh, just a really important part um, because I think if you use a public health model, owning guns could, can be safer. So in California, we have fewer gun deaths and injuries per person because we have really strong gun safety laws, uh, but there's still just a lot more we can do. Um, I think there are still too many people who are injured and killed by guns and we can do better in this way. So making sure that there's more of a focus on safely storing things, just like we, our cars became safer. You know, people, the, the airbags, the the, the analog speed, brakes, all the, of these things. The third yeah. brake, we're both old enough to remember the third brake light, right? I mean, there exactly. was a time when cars only had two brake lights and they realized that putting one higher that's more in your direct line of sight, less people were getting rear-ended. So we went with it. So this is just the, the next iteration of trying to keep more awareness and awareness equaling safety. Right. But to your, to your question about... Um, what exactly they're going to be asking. I mean, I think I've heard the concern about people lying on their on their forms. And I think there's always been insurance fraud. And you can really say that about nearly anything, like someone who's asked on their health insurance if they smoke and they say, no, you know, I don't smoke. But then they die of lung cancer and you see that their lungs indicate that they did smoke. I mean, if there is uh, any type of analysis of whether a gun was stored safely, which happens when there are when there are um, family shootings or suicides or um, school shootings, these kinds of things, they, they do, you, you, you can tell if somebody, if you, when there's an investigation, whether somebody does have a safe, whether it is safely stored, what are the practices? You interview the people in the family. You know, so that's happening on the back end after a tragedy. But I think if we all had a more collective understanding about how to safely store guns, why it's so important, that we'd be more, that, that would be more, more the norm instead of, instead of just having them loaded and 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 in the closet basically right. they're supposed to be unloaded and stored in a safe and the safe needs to be bolted to the ground so that it can't be carried away i mean guns are very portable and very um expensive so they are a, a theft item that is of high value and it they we need to make it so that the gun guns are not easily stolen from homes too that's an interesting point. There was some other legislation that I think that you were working on that was talking about digital signatures or digital marks that have to be on firearms when they're sold. Um, that was your that was your bill as well, wasn't it? That was that's micro stamping because because there's a, there are a remarkable number of crimes that are not solved um, that involve a gun and trying to link the bullet to the gun it came from the the casing to the gun it came from is um, a really important forensic investigation for law enforcement but and micro stamping is really common and easy to do but it's not the norm so this would require that all guns be micro stamped by a certain date 
you know, it's clear that this is this is a passion for you, right? It, it, that you know, we we you accept that people have guns, and if they're going to have guns, they have to follow the laws. And these are additional laws that are that are in place to protect people financially and physically. Really, if we're talking about the liability, was talking about protecting people financially, and this is something to try and keep people safer and try and keep the the firearms in the, the place that. The law already says it should be, and I think I can't emphasize that enough, is that having talked about this now and realized that this isn't so much as trying to get statistics for some nefarious reason later down the line, that it's really designed to try and bring awareness and to change behavior by uh, by giving people the ability to follow existing laws and have that positive effect on their pocketbook. Right, exactly. I mean, recognizing... The existence of the Second Amendment, the political realities of gun ownership, um, the ubiquitous nature of it in our country and our historical connection to firearms as well. It's, I mean, the West and cowboys and even people, you know, like our our um, H- Hamilton, you know, Alexander Hamilton, he was shot in a duel by the vice president, <laughs> who was Aaron Burr, and his son had been shot in a duel several years before that. I mean, just the remarkable, I think, um, historical nature of our our connection to guns in so many ways makes it to me that if you really want to, re- if we want to reduce human suffering, which is the main thing that I'm interested in when I'm thinking about homelessness or gun violence, is to really be clear eyed about what's possible. So it's not, we're not going to be a country like Japan. You know, we're not going to have we're not going to be outlying all guns. It's just, it's just not, that's just not within any realm of possibility in America that I see. And so thinking about what is it we can do to make gun ownership safer in this country. And there are many things, and this is one of them. So having insurance be part of the picture to me seems like it is, it's so obvious because guns are such a risk. And when we insure every other risk, but not this one, it's a, it's really a big oversight. So recognizing that let's start with something that we can assess, which is how, how can we help people store guns more safely? And how can we help the market use market forces to determine who is riskier and then make decisions based on that? Exactly. And, and, and I understand from the insurance perspective that they're going to be looking at this in a way and they're going to say, well, as long as we can underwrite based on this, Okay. As you know, the California climate for regulating insurance companies is, how can I put this in a, in a rated G format? It's challenging. And, and we're feeling those effects right now in a lot of different ways. So I think that as long as the industry itself, the insurance industry, has as part of the bill the ability that, okay, you want us to collect this data and as long as we can utilize that data to everyone's benefit, then I don't think you're going to see any pushback from that. And I think what tends to happen, and, and you, you know this far better than I do, is we start out in one place with one intention, but if we don't get all of it, then it looks completely different than we were anticipating it looking, right? Then it just looks like, oh, the insurance carriers are just asking me more questions and, and that's not okay and why are they asking that? But if they're asking and and they're able to say, or they're able to say, okay, I'm asking this because if you do and you have it stored properly, you're going to get a better price, just like non-smoking discounts. There have been property policies that have offered a discount for someone, for a household that has smokers or non-smokers. Why? Well, guess what? People do fall asleep with a cigarette and cause fires. So we can logically see that and people understand that and they're okay answering that question because they understand they might save money doing it. So I think if we follow this same example, as you progress forward with this bill, as long as everyone understands that this is not about coming to get your guns, this is not about creating another registry, there already is one, it's already on the books, it's law, we don't have to talk about it, right? That this is simply about trying to find a way that can save money for consumers for simply doing what the law already says they should be doing. Right. I mean, I think that there's a reality to to guns, though, that it's a bit of a third rail. Like, I don't think I don't think this bill is going to be easy. And I don't sure. So so but for the wrong reasons. Right. Exactly. But I and I but part of it is really being clear, like you just said, about what is the point of it and and recognizing that, you know, the insurance industry 
the insurance industry is a private industry for the most part. So insurance companies are, are trying to make money as most private industry <laughs> is in this country, right? So, so I encouraged in, insurance companies when I spoke at an insurance conference last year to see this as a market. You know, this is given the, the ubiquitous nature of gun ownership, this is something that has really been overlooked. And, and, and I received some positive feedback about that from members um, who, are, who are listening to it and participating, uh, because really, it's an untapped market. Uh, and, and so where do we start? How do we get any type of um, a beginning into, into being able to have insurance be a more major part of gun ownership? And I, I, you know, I think this is a really important start. And I'll also just say for the, in case anyone is concerned about this part of my bill is that the information is scrubbed of all uh, any specific details. So it's right, you're, you know, it's this, right in the bill. It says no name, no address. Right. There's, there's nothing like that in there. Right. I mean, the insurance companies obviously have the information and we want them to have it, just like they have the information on everything in your home that you insure, your diamond ring or your Picasso or whatever it is that you're insuring. Um, you know, the gun w is the same, is, would be in that same category. So insurance companies have all that information, but it's not being passed along to the government. It's, it's being aggregated. So the information is provided to the Department of Justice and to the state so that so that we are we're able to know in aggregate how safely are guns being stored? Should we have public service announcements about this? Should it be things that are more prominent in schools or in doctor's offices about the risks of not safely storing your gun? You know, it driving also how we communicate about risks. Um, so, you know, right now, a lot of the information we have is really anecdotal about how people are storing guns. And this would make it so that it was much more data driven. That was another question that I was going to have. And, and, you, and you nailed it is, well, if, if you're just getting raw numbers, at the end of the day, right? Every year. I believe the bill, if, if it goes as planned, is <clears throat> January 26, uh, January 1st, 2026 is when the data collection is supposed to be, I shouldn't even say collection, the, the questions should be asked on the applications. And then one year later, January 1st, 2027, they take all the person's information away and they basically send these raw numbers to, to, the, to the state. And the question I had, and you've just answered it beautifully, is, well, well, that. What are you doing with that information? And so, your your go the goal is not to see that number drop. It's just to see what what a num what that number actually is, so that you can focus resources to be sure that that per that number of folks, those people that do have firearms, are aware of how to store it. And you can hope that if they're on that list, you know that they've at least been told at that point yet again that it's supposed to be stored, it's supposed to be locked, and, and the guidelines to follow to do that and, and to abide by the law. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions about gun ownership. Like, some people think you're actually safer with a gun, but statistically, you are less safe with a gun in the home. Because, because of the accidental shootings, because of the risk of suicide, of domestic violence, of um, basically things that happen by impulse. I mean, if, it, you know, when when you're, someone's feeling suicidal and there's a gun sitting out, it's much different than than have than pre planning something that you have to do where the impulse might pass. Right. So so these domestic violence and suicide being high, the, those are high percentages when you look at our gun deaths and injuries. So so how can we make it so that there's a little bit more of a barrier to those types of things happening. I mean, we would be better off as a society. We'd be safer. You know, we'd have less tragedy. We'd have fewer accidental shootings of the kid who shoots his cousin who came over, that kind of thing. You know, these really tragic stories that they, they're, it's a ripple effect of trauma on families and, and the people who love the people. You know, it's just, it's re remarkable how many people have been touched by gun violence and it's truly tragic. What's interesting is you, you, br you bring up another interesting point is that this is not you're, you're not talking about gangs. You're not talking about violence in the streets. You're not talking about, you know, people with open carry walking around and having a fight in a bar. You're talking about people in their homes that are being right. negatively affected by this within their homes. Not, there are no outside forces involved and, and trying to find a way to bring some awareness to that to try and prevent some of these things that are, that are happening. Do you have an idea, and I don't mean to put you on the spot with numbers, of, of what the numbers, the statistics are with regard to the injuries and deaths caused by guns 
from within the house versus crime outside with guns? I don't have that. But, you know, when you think about just the intentional versus unintentional, you know, and, and if suicides are considered intentional, mo- more of the of gun, gun injuries are intentional. So, but even eliminating the portion that are unintentional, you know, where there's the accidental shootings, I think those, you know, those, those, those are truly tragic as, I mean, as all gun injuries are, of course, um, but, you know, so, so there, there are different types of things to get at, right? Are we getting at domestic violence or suicide or school shootings or accidental shootings or, you know, there are just, there are lots of different categories of when it comes up, but in all of them, it's better that the gun is safely stored. Right. I mean, it's, <laughs> if, if you start out without the gun, you know, you're li- you're more likely to not have a gun incident, right? And and I, I guess <laughs> right. this is again, I have to keep saying this, even though I know I've said it already. This is nothing new. This is literally right. just creating a bill that's going to reward you for following the law. And 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 that's that's sort of the mantra that keeps going through my head because I know I'm going to get calls and emails and all sorts of stuff of people oh guns they're taught they want they want to keep track of my guns they want to do all these okay that's already done that's that's long been done right when you purchase a firearm you have to pass a test you have to file you have to register you have to do all these things all this bill is doing is it's sort of a little gentle tap 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 remind reminder that look follow the law and you can save some money on your insurance. And I think that's the part, at least from my perspective, the, with the insurance hat on, is that people need to look at this as something that, okay, insurance prices are going up. We all know that. And, and it's because of climate. It's because of claims. It's because of all these things that are going on, right? And here is something that's being introduced that can actually lower the premium. This is a win-win for everybody because this is going to give them something they can do to lower their price. There does, there's not a day that doesn't go by where I get a phone call and people are saying, what can I do to lower my cost for my insurance? Or I'll get a call from a studio and they want to, they want me to come in and talk with the reporters about what's a good, what are suggestions? What are five things to do to save money on your insurance? And we go through them, right? You know, well, raise your deductible, you know, put in a burglar alarm, you know, do all these things. And here you are introducing a bill that's going to give another way for people to save money on their insurance. Again, I think as well, long as everyone understands that that's, that's the end result of this, right? That's, that's the goalpost. Well, yeah, I, I mean, ideally, but you, let's just also remember that my bill does not, is not starting with any requirement for insurance companies to do anything with this data. I mean, really what the, cause the bill is only requiring the collection of the data. So, uh, and I, you know, you have to start with something that's possibly achievable. So, you know, I think my hope is that the market forces work when the data is available so that then it will drive premiums and it will drive choices about what, like different gun types are obviously have different danger thresholds. Oh, right? you could get so, very granular with this. You're right. Right. And so, and, and having, maybe having 17 guns in the home versus having one handgun that's safely stored, maybe that also might indicate that there's a higher level of potential danger, you know? So there are things that insurance companies could decide based to, to, um, to work on or to charge for, but that's not this bill. This bill is only about the data of whether the gun is safely stored. So we're hoping insurance, I'm hoping insurance companies would use that data, but, but that, you know, that's something that that they would have to assess. So, and I just want to be clear about that because if my bill passes, it's not your home insurance, homeowner's insurance is not necessarily going to go down because of this, because it just, it's not, it's not going all the, all that way. Well, as you said, it's just introduced and I'm sure it'll go through, you know, lots of machinations and things of that nature. And I can tell you just having been in the industry for as long as I have that carriers, the more data they have, the better they can price risk. So if they are able to, and I say able to because they're, as you know, in California, there's heavy regulations that will dictate what an insurance company can look at and what they can't look at. So I think as long as they have the ability to to, uh, to underwrite right. and offer a discount for something like this, there's no reason why they wouldn't. Because as you said, there's plenty of data that they can rely on to statistically show you know, whether what, what the level of risk is depending on how the storage is being done. Right. Exactly. 
You've got it, Carl. Thank you. <laughs> there you there you go. Well, again, is there anything else that I haven't covered that you think is important that people know? I know what's important to me, and I know that I, I hear the message loud and clear, and, and I can't see there being a downside to it per se, because again, we're just rewarding we're, we're rewarding behavior that's already of the law. It's it's almost comical when you stop and think about it, right? You know, it's like when the light turns green and you walk, give them a treat. Well, of course, they're, if they, they're supposed to walk when the light's green, but we're literally going to try and incentivize them to do what the law already says. So, you know, that's sort of what keeps going through my mind. And is there, is there something specific that, uh, that we haven't covered that you think is important that people are aware of? No, I think you you comprehensively covered it. I think I think you've got it. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Well, again, I thank you so much for being here. If you have questions, is there a place where people can reach out to you to ask you directly? Uh, is uh, that you want you want to provide that information now, and I can also put it in the sure. notes. Sure, um, it's senator Blakespear at senate.ca.gov. So I. Um, you know, I represent almost a million people in the San Diego and Orange County area. So uh, we receive a lot of email and but uh, someone on my staff will definitely get back to you if you email me. So please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And we'll put all of your contact information in the show notes as well. And if anybody forgets or, or doesn't catch that, or maybe they didn't get the beginning of this and they want to reach out to me, and I'll certainly pass them on to you as well so they can they can connect. It's all about understanding what this is what this bill really is about. And I don't think there's a there really should be opposition if people understand what it actually is doing. Right. Okay, yeah. well I thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Carl. Have a great day. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.